Hey everyone, James here. Today I'm going to be talking some more about some Italian genre films. Today we're going to be talking about giallos. This is not going to be a film review though, but I'm going to be doing what you know I like to think of is a fun exercise. Maybe you'll agree with me, maybe you won't. I would be very curious to hear. But I'm going to be naming the Mount Rushmore of Jolly directors and picking four films uh, to canonize or basically take to the grave with it. So basically four films uh, in the words of Bill Simmons that you would like put on their tombstone and it's like, these are the ones that you're really gonna be remembered by uh, for the jolly genre. And for me, why, why do this? Uh, well, first of all, it's fun. I, I am a list enjoyer. I both enjoy uh, uh, looking at other people's lists and finding different stuff to watch as well as uh, making my own. And I think it's an interesting exercise to think of especially when we think of sort of the context of who, what films and stuff like that. Uh, if you're like me, you like to uh, evangelize about these different films, try to show different friends different things. So I spend a lot of time, perhaps too much, thinking about what films uh, different people in my life might enjoy in order to uh, convert them uh, to the uh, holy altar of jelly. And so, uh, so for me, it's a, a combination of just kind of a fun exercise as well as just like a different way to think about these things. Um, so Mount Rushmore, uh, for those of you not familiar, it's a monument with uh, the heads of four presidents, uh, U.S. presidents there. So we're trying to think of kind of like four uh, jolly directors uh, that we could really uh, put on that list. And I think for different genres and stuff like that, if we're like thinking of like the Mount Rushmore film noir directors or something like that, it might be a little more challenging. Uh, for Jolly, I think it comes very natural because I think there's a very logical four uh, to put out there. Perhaps you disagree with me, but for me, coming up with the four was very, very easy uh, with them. Um, so yeah, and I also wanted to just name a couple of their films, so the four films there. So I think this uh, this um, list or of, of four times four is going to be a great place for anyone to get started into Jolly, just because you're going to get four different directors who all kind of have a little bit of a different take. Some are more in the golden age, some are sort of sprinkled throughout the year. So it's a really good way to get a sampling of it and not be too restricted because there are certain kind of like Jolly images and stuff like that, that we might have of, uh, of kind of the genre in general. And if you just watch Argento films, uh, you're going to get a very different feel for the genre than if you kind of spread the love around, uh, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I think it's an interesting way to sort of track the genre and different trends and stuff like that. And aiming for kind of a good set of directors means that you're also going to meet, uh, in my opinion at least, a certain quality threshold with these films. So you're not just watching uh, kind of uh, me mediocre or bottom of the barrel stuff. Because I do think it's very important to get started uh, showing kind of what are some of the strengths of the genre. Um, yeah, Jolly is a genre that really does have a great middle class of films too. So there are a lot of films to check out uh, beyond the 16, no doubt. Uh, but this is kind of just a, a useful framework, uh, in my opinion, to sort of get started. All right, so let's, uh, before I get in, a couple uh, that don't quite make it. And I think one of the things here is that like the volume of films. And I do think the directors that had success with these movies and did a good job, potentially had a box office success, did tend to get uh, kind of second and third and fourth opportunities here. So I think part of this is just like how many films uh, did they direct? How many Jolly did they get a chance to direct? And, uh, and all four of these directors directed at least five films. Uh, one director that didn't make it, that did direct a lot of different Jolly, is Umberto Lindsay, who had a very interesting career throughout the Jolly. For me at least, his, the quality of his films, well, they can be decent, uh, don't quite match the quality of kind of the four directors that I'm thinking of uh, that sort of uh, uh, I'm putting on to the Mount Rushmore. A couple others that are sort of near, near misses or misses are Alan Lotto, Luciano Arcoli, Luigi Bazzoni. Uh, for me at least, uh, these three uh, just don't quite have the number of jolly and don't have the same sort of impact that sort of the bigger names uh, do. Aldo Lado in particular, especially if you consider Short Night of Glass Dolls a jolly, uh, that and Who Saw or Die are both absolutely worthy jollies, uh, very, very good jollies. But uh, other than that, I mean, he didn't direct a whole lot. I think you would have a hard time calling like Night Train Murders a jolly and stuff like that. So I don't think, I think, I think the amount of output and things that you're gonna, uh, is an important factor uh, when thinking about uh, kind of these different Jolly directors. All right, so let's get into the list. All right, so starting off with perhaps the only logical director to start with, we have Mario Bava. Um, and Mario Bava, if we, 
and we think about kind of the strengths and what people love about the Jolly. He brought so much of that to the table uh, already and from the get-go. And I mean, he is kind of the originator of the Jolly. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, the love of set pieces, the visuals, uh, the technically uh, marvelous filmmaking that he would often do. So, so many of the kind of uh, trademarks that we would have of Jolly uh, are already in his film. So you could watch Bud and Black Lace and go straight into the 1970s Jolly and be like, okay, yes, I see what's happening here. Perhaps there's a little bit more old timiness in Bun Black Laced, but, uh, but the lineage is extremely clear. Um, so I think in that sense, uh, he is impossible to leave off. Uh, not to mention that I think especially three of his Jolly are, are absolute all timers for me. Uh, okay, so he's one that I think coming up with that fourth film is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, he only directed actually uh, five Jolly, I believe, and, uh, and so uh, three of them are really, really good. And I think there's a bit of a drop off after that, but you know, it is what it is. Um, so yeah, first up uh, the, of the four films, Girl Who Knew Too Much, which is a really interesting film. Uh, I don't think it's the first Jolly people should watch because it is so different. This one, uh, even though I think it was the same year or within a year of Blood and Black Lace, it feels much older. Uh, a huge chunk of that is because it's black and white. And it does kind of show a different sign of influences than we're perhaps used to seeing uh, more of that Hitchcock feel to it, uh, down to the title and stuff like that. Uh, a little bit more of an intriguing mystery than what would the genre would eventually become known for. Um, so Bun Black Lace, I think, is the one that people are really going to hone in on in the 1960s Jolly. What's interesting about this is, yeah, it, this is uh, very much ahead of its time and predictive of kind of the 1970s Jollies, uh, post-Bird with the Crystal Plumage, but actually very, very atypical of uh, kind of the Jollies that would immediately come after this. Uh, something like Lead Diabolique had a much bigger impact on kind of those 1960s ones, which uh, kind of atoned in cast and sort of these domestic thrillers, uh, m many of them centered around inheritance. This has some of those characteristics, but it is, uh, I I'd say this is much more of the proto slasher or proto 1970s uh, Jolly that would come. Uh, and then we kind of have him moving into the golden age of Jolly, where he can respond to some of the industry trends. We have Bay of Blood, which is a marvelous film, uh, just great from a technical standpoint. And I think this film has very much a lot of the strengths and weaknesses that we would associate with Jolly's. The storyline, pretty paper thin, uh, but how it goes about it is a really good, strong soundtrack. Uh, and Baba, just technically a very genius, doing this all on a very minimal budget. So the fourth film I choose to take with him uh, to canonize with uh, Baba would be Hatchet for the Honeymoon, which is uh, definitely not uh, in the probably top 10 of Mario Baba, at least in my opinion, but is an interesting film and very unique and different. So in that sense, I do admire the film, not one that, you know, I'm going to go back to often to revisit or anything like that, but it is a interesting, um, definitely an interesting giallo. And I think uh, for him, at least, I would strongly recommend watching those first three first and then going on to something like uh, Hatchet for the Honeymoon. Okay, next up um, is Dario Argento. And uh, again, kind of like I said for Baba, very easy to see the lineage of uh, directorial characteristics. Many of his strengths and weaknesses are more or less the same as Mario Baba. Definitely, um, especially as his career went on, the storyline for his films is not especially... Um, uh, logical, as someone like Ernesto Gasaldi might uh, hone in on, but uh, he has just an incredible visual eye. While he wasn't quite the technical marvel as uh, Mario Baba, I think he had the resources and stuff like that to absolutely pull off some incredible stuff, um, so a strong focus on the aesthetic. Another thing that you can partly credit, I think, to Argento is um, kind of the associations with just wonderful uh, soundtracks. Um, he worked with Ennio Morricone for the Animal Trilogy and then again uh, later on in his career, but especially well known for uh, his work with Goblin and Claudio Simonetti uh, in a number of his most notable films. Um, and just a really unique use of soundtrack. And personally, I'm not a huge fan of the way Dario Argento uses a uh, soundtrack in a lot of his later films, so kind of from Phenomena uh, later. Sometimes those, those can be very hit or miss for me, but I would say in two of his best Jolly, Deep Red and Tenebrae, those are absolute all-timer uses of music for me. Per, for me. So uh, 
you know, it's uneven, but when he hits and he hits and uh, they're, they're things that will absolutely stick with you uh, as you watch and rewatch his film. So for me, easily perhaps the most rewatchable uh, director as well of these and personally my favorite, even though that's such a uh, kind of a, a cliche, normal thing to say. But, you know, I, I love Dario Argento. I love his films. And for me, at least, these are extremely rewatchable and extremely enjoyable uh, to this day, even though I've seen uh, a lot of them many times. All right, so picking four films to, four Gialli films to canonize with Argento, pretty easy, in my opinion. Uh, Bird with the Crystal Plumage is up first, which is just really good Golden Age Jolly. If you're gonna pick one Golden Age Jolly to represent that, this is the one to pick. Um, this is an absolutely great intro jolly, probably the best intro jolly. And I think, um, yeah, it, it just has everything there and it just works really well still as a film. And uh, yeah, so I, I think this one's fantastic. Uh, next up, Deep Red, which depending on the day, could be 1A or 1B as my favorite jolly. Uh, just uh, kind of bringing sort of that golden age to a halt there and just sort of showcasing everything there. Probably one of the scarier jollies and absolutely one of the most memorable great music and really does kind of bridge that gap from his earlier animal trilogy to Suspiria and Inferno which would come uh, but this this uh, exercise is not about those films because those are not jolly so one the other part of the 1A 1B depending on the day is Tenebrae uh, for me uh, this one was a grower on me Deep Red was an initial like I love this film this is uh, great uh, for Tenebrae is one that I became began to appreciate just because of the fresh and interesting twists on the genre that he brings to it. It's a very self-aware film, but not self-aware in a way that really does bother me at all. So uh, great set pieces, great score, totally different look to Deep Red. So um, absolutely an essential jalo. So uh, yeah, uh, definitely put that there. And then last up, I will pick Opera. This is probably the least important of the three but I think uh, it absolutely does showcase his um, skill in terms of crafting set pieces. The crow set piece is one that needs to be seen to be believed. Uh, again, it does have a little bit of like uneven Argento-ness. I'm not a huge fan of the ending, but definitely absolutely one of my uh, favorite Jolly films. <clears throat> okay, so number three on our Mount Rushmore, I am putting uh, Sergio Martino, who is a uh, very, workmanlike uh, compared to these. And I think here's where you start to have kind of the image of Giallo uh, deviate a little bit. And, you know, Martino did have a lot of the characteristics of uh, Dario Argento and Mero Baba films. He only really started making these uh, after Bird with the Crystal Plumage came out. So the influence of a huge box office success like that definitely had an impact on kind of what you'd, uh, he would go into do. He's someone that's probably uh, most often associated with different collaborators. Of course, his brother Luciano Martino, who is a producer, uh, Ernesto Gastaldi, a writer. And Gastaldi, interestingly, uh, while he worked a lot with Martino, uh, he was writing these jollies before Bird with the Crystal Plumage out. So he's writing a lot of these more domestic doors, uh, Le Diabolique inspired ones, um, Sweet Body of Deborah, I believe he wrote, as well as uh, So Sweet, So Perverse, some of those Lindsay ones. And so uh, you can really see the collaborations of Gastaldi and uh, Martino sort of bridging that gap of those domestic thrillers and then putting in, taking in these different elements from Argento, the Black Glove Killers and stuff like that. And that's one of those things where once you think about it and then you watch something like The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, it's hard to unsee because those films do have both elements and going on. And then acting wise, he collaborated a lot with Edward Fennick, who is perhaps the most memorable face of the golden age of Giallo and George Hilton. So uh, Martino uh, really did follow industry trends. So he worked in all kinds of different genres. Personally, my favorite films of him are definitely his Jallos. Because of him following trends, uh, most of his uh, Jallo work took place in kind of that very golden period of Jolly. So 1970 to, 1970 to 1973 is when he directed most of his big uh, notable ones there. Um, and Gastaldi, uh, the writer for many of his films, uh, is a little bit less focused on set pieces. Not that Martino set pieces aren't good, uh, but a little bit more on uh, kind of logical and uh, kind of the mystery elements. So if you are someone that uh, will watch an Argento or Bava film and find them to be kind of like a little empty as far as storyline, um, 
then Martino might be a very good gap because he his films are bring a little bit more balance to it in terms of uh, kind of stuff to focus on, and yeah, they might. And, and and he still is very much kind of a showman and has some really nice uh, set pieces and stuff like that in there. Choosing the four films to take with him, I think, is a, is more challenging uh, than probably both Argento and Baba. So it's I think there's six, five or six films that you could really uh, slot into here, depending on what you wanted to focus on. I was almost tempted to put Suspicious Death of a Minor in here, even though it's probably a little bit less... Uh, clearly a giallo, just because it's interesting in the sense that it combines the giallo and Poliziotesky. Last, I chose to exclude it, so here it goes. Uh, Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, uh, All the Colors of the Dark, Your Vice is a Locked Room, and Only I Have the Key, and Torso. Um, I would say of these four, Torso is kind of the outlier, but I think it's absolutely essential as far as jolly go. I really love it. I think it's definitely in my probably top seven jolly. I like the twist. I like the suspense focus and stuff like that. It has less of a story uh, than perhaps these others, which are often filled, filled with uh, a lot of pulpy, uh, fun storyline to it. So uh, yeah, and these other three, I don't know. I mean, they all just uh, kind of have a lot. They're all made in a very kind of similar period. A lot of the cast is in one and then another, um, and they all have similar writers and stuff like that. So uh, they all kind of just are a little bit different flavors uh, to it. So I think uh, if you are able to watch these Martino films, many of which are available on Tubi, uh, they will provide a very nice contrast and show you other things that were going on in the genre beyond uh, just kind of your your uh, Argentos and your Babas. All right, and last up we have, of course, uh, Lucio Fulci, uh, who is interestingly definitely more well known uh, for his other films, uh, such like Zombie, especially, as well as the Gates of Hell trilogy. And I think that should change a bit because I think his Jolly are fantastic. For me, at least, I, I think Fulci is probably my second favorite of these four um, directors in terms of what he does. And I think I like his Jolly almost just as much, if not more, than uh, his, uh, his Gates of Hell trilogy. Um, so, He's, uh, and I think these films will really show you uh, that diversity and kind of the um, flexibility that he had in terms of bringing different stuff to it. Many of them do defy kind of his reputation as sort of like a schlock master uh, with things like zombie and stuff like that. And I think the subtext of his films is often a little bit richer uh, than you would expect uh, from someone that kind of brought those films there. But also, um, also in comparison to perhaps some of the uh, Argento shots, which, you know, can be absolutely beautiful canvases, but if you're someone that's looking for a little bit more subtext and, and commentary and things like that, uh, you're not necessarily going to get a lot of that in uh, Argento's work, whereas you do uh, in Fulci's Jolly, uh, Don't Torture Dutch thing in terms of kind of like the Italian country, countryside and sort of like the different communities and stuff there, uh, all the way to the New York River, which I would make a case definitely has some interesting themes uh, going on throughout it. Uh, lizard and woman's skin, sort of like the gaslighting and in like perspective and things like that. So there's definitely some really interesting things going on uh, for the Fulci films, and they're all very different. Sort of like Argento, he worked partly in the golden age, but partly outside of it. He was probably the other big notable director that was making really good films outside of the golden age. Um, so yeah, the four I got here are Don't Torture Ducking, Duckling, Lizard and Woman's Skin. Those represent kind of the golden age jolly. Unlike Martino's, I think these two are very different from one another. One is rural set, and the other one is uh, set in uh, London, I believe. Uh, the Psychic, uh, which is actually my personal favorite of his films, a really, really good, uh, interesting thriller. And uh, The New York Ripper, uh, which I think, uh, yeah, it's great. It's definitely perhaps uh, the second or third best Jalo that came out after the 80s started. And I think, uh, yeah, New York Ripper is the only one that really came out after uh, Zombie and uh, Gates of Hell. Well, I guess uh, Murder Rock did too. But uh, it's, uh, it's one that, knowing where he was in his career, having directed and had success with those films, uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I think it's more than just uh, shock material for sure. Okay, well, that wraps this up. Let me know how you enjoyed this, uh, this kind of exercise. I think, um, I, I think this list is actually a pretty good place to get started. I think if you watched uh, these 4x4, four four, so the 16 films, you would have a pretty nice uh, kind of uh, 
springboard to really just jump into different jollies and stuff like that. You might be like, oh, I like those Martinos, and so I can check out the rest of Sergio Martino and maybe some that are more similar to that. Or maybe you're uh, a fan of just kind of the classics, Argento Bava, and so you want to watch the rest of those. So uh, yeah, uh, let me know how you liked it. I Give it the thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see more uh, more reviews or, and just videos on Italian Pilatioteskis and Jolly films. And I will see y'all next time.